Okay, ladies and gentlemen, if I encourage you to take your seats and we'll get going on our closing plenary session. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, if I can ask you to wrap up all the good conversations that you've been having, and I know from the sessions that I've seen, it's been a very rich debate through the course of the day, um, many vibrant exchanges around the themes that we've had before us. So it's wonderful to come together in the closing plenary and start to pull some of those strands together to say, what, what ideas have you all been coming up with that you see as critical messages to the European Union and its member states in taking forward this agenda? agenda of business and human rights. Now, we're starting about 15 minutes late, so um, we're going to be a wee bit late into those uh, drinks afterwards, but uh, hopefully we'll keep this session within the hour um, allocated so that we can get on to the, the, the fun part of the evening after all of this. Um, there's a lot we want to fit in, though, uh, today, and throughout these plenary sessions and other sessions, uh, there have been various high-level messages and little bits of video, and we've not wanted to overburden any one session with too many um, too many video pieces, but we did have a, a short video message from John Ruggie as well, wishing this conference uh, well, and we wanted to bring that in before we close out today. Um, in the interests of time, we've cut John off in his prime, so it's a slightly curtailed little video piece, but he's not here to protest, so that's okay. Um, so with apologies for the jumpy start to it, um, a few words for John Ruggie to start off our closing session. In addition, the um, 2011 EU uh, Commission Directive on CSR was a welcome step um, in the right direction of deepening understanding of what corporate responsibility entails um, throughout uh, the EU. The Non-Financial Reporting Initiative recently uh, adopted, similarly, uh, is an important step because of the uh, role that transparency plays um, in enhancing accountability. So congratulations and thanks to the EU for these and many other um, measures that you have undertaken um, as um, a commission um, and as a group of member states. At the same time, the, the promise of the 2011 communication has not been fully realized. For example, uh, developing guidance for individual sectors stopped at three, uh, has not been followed up since. National action plans have been very slow to materialize. The new CSR policy was due uh, last year. Um, I hope and expect uh, not only that it remains fully aligned with the GPs, with the guiding principles, but that it also deepens the understanding um, of them and the spread um, into the SME community, for example, small and medium-sized enterprises. Going forward, the EU should make it clear that when it says that it supports the respect for human rights among companies, that the EU doesn't simply mean EU companies operating in the EU or foreign companies operating in the EU, but also EU-based companies operating overseas, where many difficult situations uh, still um, exist. The EU also needs to demonstrate that it is serious when it says that it expects companies to abide by the guiding principles or the OECD guidelines. And the way to show seriousness uh, is actually to incorporate um, these as policy requirements uh, in your relationships with the business community as a procurer of goods and services, for example, 
or when you otherwise support the operations um, of business. Um, in relation to access to remedy, um, the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe recently issued a number of very useful recommendations to member states. This is something that the EU can draw on uh, to take further steps um, in operationalizing those recommendations. After all, it should be easier to do that um, in the EU than in the larger and more diverse Council of Europe. In short, we've come a long way, but there is still a long way to go, and we need all hands on deck, as my favorite boss Kofi Annan used to say. So many thanks again for your leadership in the past, and I very much hope for your continued leadership as we go forward. Thank you, and have a constructive conference. Okay, so a, a call to action from John Ruggie there for further progress, further leadership from the European Union. And I'm really pleased now to invite onto stage Debbie Stotthard um, to give us a vision statement from a civil society perspective. Uh, Debbie is the Secretary General of FIDASH, the International Federation for Human Rights, but also the founder of ALTSEAN, the uh, alternative ASEAN um, network on Burma. Um, and She's going to share with us a few extemporaneous reflections, having been in the sessions and listened to what's been discussed today, about where we need to go from here. Debbie, over to you. Thank you, Caroline. I'll keep this short and sweet and hopefully pointed, because I don't have a speech. I just have a quarter page of scroll notes. Firstly, um, we would, firstly the EU, to, for many of us on the ground, including in Asia, European policies, European position to promote and protect human rights, including guidelines for the protection of human rights defenders, has been something of a very good example that has gained a lot of uh, credit and legitimacy in the eyes of the human rights community and marginalized communities in Asia. However, there's been a slide. And the slide um, is mostly um, evident in the lack of policy coherence and consistency, particularly when it comes to business and human rights. And that's, this is why it is absolutely important moving forward that, um, you know, to draw on what uh, uh, Richard said, um, Europe has to lift its game when it comes to business and human rights. Um, um, or risk losing its credibility in the region when it comes to advocating for human rights. By that, I mean not just talking about talking the talk, but European institutions respecting their own laws and mechanisms, such as the European Ombudsman, finding uh, that the Commission was guilty of maladministration when they did not include a commitment to, the hum to human rights impact assessment in the Vietnam Free Trade Agreement. Um, that hasn't yet been fixed. The recommendations of the Ombudsman have not been heeded or implemented. So if European Commission does not actually um, comply or um, take up those that the advice of its own Ombudsman, it's very easy for uh, recalcitrant Asian states or states in other parts of the world or businesses in other institutions in other parts of the world saying, why should we listen to Europe when Europe doesn't listen to itself? So this is quite um, an important thing moving forward. Having a vision where the European commitment to business and human rights is based on uh, policy coherence and consistency, where European institutions, European citizens, and, business and businesses actually respect their own rights and mechanisms. Um, and when we talk about commitment to business and human rights, we are facing a global phenomenon, a, a global problem, an acceleration of land grabbing, uh, which involves even lethal violence against um, ethnic and indigenous communities around the world. And some of the beneficiaries of these violent acts are directly or indirectly European companies. So we do need to address this. This is the time that we really need to see Europe committing itself 
to its own principles of human rights. And when we talk about commitment and implementing that commitment, we are not just talking about protection of communities and marginalized social minorities in Asia, Middle East, Africa, or Latin America. We're talking about making, uh, ensuring that that protection also extends to other people in Europe because this is not just business and human rights for the non-Europeans. It has to be business and human rights for everyone from Europe, uh, and being implemented and committed in principle by Europe. Now, um, one of the things that came up during some of the discussions was the need to be extra vigilant and extra diligent when it comes to engaging with uh, countries and communities that are undergoing conflict or are in a post-conflict situation. I think there is a very uh, dire risk that well-meaning companies could actually worsen the, the impacts and perpetuate the impacts of conflict on marginalized communities. One very clear example that comes to mind was a, beer, a European beer company talking about their innovative idea to um, work with Burmese rice farmers to, to work out whether they can start making beer using Burmese rice. From the perspective of the manufacturer, this was um, an opportunity to contribute to the development and the wealth of farmers. From the Burmese persp grassroots perspective, this was a danger, a threat to increase um, land confiscation and land grabbing from smallholder farmers so that crony companies can benefit from this initiative and that this initiative would take rice away from the consumption of local, local populations and undermine food security in the country. So it's quite clear when we do due diligence in post-conflict situations that we do companies and states do need to work in a very deep and, and extensive way with civil society and affected communities. And this is also why the vision of Europe taking the leadership on business and human rights means committing in a very real way to implementing processes that will allow local communities to have real, free, prior, and informed consent in order to prevent uh, problems happening further, further down the, the front, further down the track. Um, one other message from the grassroots is, please don't be afraid of a treaty. For many of us, human rights defenders and affected communities from the, from, from the ground, where, where our states may not comply by their duty to protect. In fact, they might be the key perpetrators where the, the rule of law is semi or non-existence, where access to justice and access to remedy is a very fraught and dangerous proce process. We do need a treaty to address those, um, those gaps. And we, we think that a treaty is not contradictory. In fact, it could be mutually reinforce the UN guiding principles. Um, on the grassroots too, there is clearly a need for a commitment by companies um, to ensure that whistleblowers and people who actually make the effort to lodge complaints are not penalized for trying to seek solutions. Fi and and, and um, I always say this, and I'll say this here, women, women, women. Whether you're dealing with ethnic and religious minorities, rural poor, urban poor, workers and so on, please make the effort to ensure that women, not just women as participants, but that we create the environment that allow women to become leaders in the search for finding solutions and also implementing them. Please make women your partners. And finally, um, uh, one of the steps that FIDH has done over the years is to produce uh, uh, um, 
a guide on corporate accountability to help affected communities and NGOs uh, uh, explore the different ways of accessing remedy and justice. And um, in keeping with Netherlands' commitment to a paperless presidency, I'm pleased to announce that FIDH has actually pr uh, produced its third update of the guide, which is easily downloaded from our website. Um, thank you very much for having this one day very intense conversation. I hope that uh, what I have uh, shared with you is a reasonable representation of the voices, whether they are the voices of the community represented so bravely and ably by Pablo from Ecuador who came all the way, or whether it is the, the, the young women I work with from war-torn Kachin state and uh, from the women I work with from the Rohingya community, one of the most persecuted peoples in the world, I happen to be in Burma, who are still under threat despite the establishment of a democratically elected civilian government. I hope that you will hear these points and these voices in that spirit and work to incorporate that in how you move forward as Europe. Europe is still a very powerful player. And please empower yourself to make sure that human rights, business and human rights become a reality in our region and in the rest of the world. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you to Debbie for those inspiring words that remind us that this is not the closing of a conversation in this last session today, but the leaping off point for some action that needs to happen over the years to come. And so clearly delivering that message of the need to lift the game um, and, and really drive this forward, to be a model for other states, but also remember that it's about people right here in the European Union as well and keeping women as partners as a central part of that as well. The organizers have been working really hard through all of the breaks and after the last parallel sessions to pull together some strands from the reporters from the different uh, sessions you've been having to look at what some of the key messages, outcomes are that uh, we need to take away today. Um, so I'm going to run through a, th a few of those that are going to appear on slides for you overhead. Um, there are many other bits that have been coming through, and, and I know the organizers have been capturing everything. So all we're trying to do here is pull out some of the key messages. So the first little cluster of issues is perhaps about the enabling environment in some way, that high-level policy framing for this. Um, we're seeing here messages that the EU should facilitate peer learning, including national reviews, to support all member states to develop uh, and implement strong national action plans. That it should also develop its own coherent strategy for implementation at the EU level across all directorates general, so that policy coherence point for integration into the forthcoming EU action plan on responsible business conduct. And uh, an important interesting one here that the EU and its member states need to encourage companies and investors to mitigate this focus on short-term financial results uh, in order to attract long-term investors and promote greater respect for human rights and sustainability. So three factors about an, an enabling environment. Then we have um, two very rich ones around um, access to remedy here. The first, that the EU and member states should take steps to remove legal, procedural and institutional barriers within Europe that prevent victims of business-related human rights abuse from gaining access to judicial remedy in both transnational and domestic cases, and looking to the Council of Europe uh, and UN recommendations uh, as useful guidance in that regard, involving bars and judges associations in finding solutions. And secondly, that the EU and its member states should strengthen access to non-judicial remedy using the full array of possible uh, state-based grievance mechanisms, uh, including by aligning practices and strengthening the capacity of the national contact points of the OECD uh, within as well as outside the EU, demanding stronger accountability mechanisms through their own board positions in international finance institutions, and strengthening the judicial system as the essential backbone of the non-judicial uh, grievance mechanism system as well. The third slide moves us on to human rights due diligence, and a number of strands seem to cluster under this. We've had rich conversations in the earlier plenary as well as parallel sessions. 
So the idea here um, is that we need to see the EU and its member states ensuring that human rights due diligence is implemented by business enterprises using the full range of options and that these include the following. Leading by example in their own due diligence in their procurement and export credit policies and practices. Supporting multi-stakeholder platforms that move beyond dialogue to develop shared agendas for action to implement due diligence, building on the Dutch covenant experience we heard about. Giving clear guidance to companies on the inclusion of human rights due diligence information in their reporting, now in line with the incoming non-financial reporting directive, for example, using the UN Guiding Principles reporting framework. Adjusting tort law, we heard about this in the plenary before lunch, uh, to reflect the scope of the corporate responsibility to respect human rights as outlined in the guiding principles. And providing advice to companies operating in conflict areas on the human rights related risks that exist and on steps to manage them. And Debbie highlighted there as well the laws of unintended consequences that we need to be aware of in those environments particularly. And a fourth and final cluster of three points here, and we heard uh, this one from Debbie very clearly as well. The EU and its member states should not be scared of the process um, to come through a, a, a UN binding uh, instrument and should also not wait for it before improving access to remedy for victims in the short term. And the EU and its member states should acknowledge the integral importance of the guiding principles to achieving the global goals for sustainable development. Um, the first essential step for all companies in contributing to the global goals must be to do no harm to people and planet. These guiding principles should be integrated into the financing mechanisms for this, including through public-private partnerships um, and also uh, included in national development plans. And finally, uh, the EU and its member states should improve implementation and monitoring of the trade and sustainable development provisions in EU trade agreements. So there's a great deal there, as you can see, uh, a lot of richness in the conversations, a lot of richness in the points coming out of it that can feed forwards, hopefully, into uh, what the European Union itself and governments talk about going forward. Right now, we have three excellent panelists here on the stage to help us have a bit of a conversation about some of what we've been hearing. So let me introduce them. We have Ambassador Marine de Carnet Trequesson, who is the French ambassador for corporate social responsibility. We have Edward Nazarski, who is the director of Amnesty International Netherlands. And we have Ray Lindsay, who is a partner with the law firm Clifford Chance. So welcome to all of you. Marine, let me start with you. We heard a little bit there about national action plans, uh, the need for peer review, the need for the EU to develop its own action plan. You're coming from a government perspective, where this is highly relevant, and France has its own process in train at the moment. How do you see the relevance of national action plans and this question of coherence between and among them? Yes, thank you very much. I hope it's working. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I think, first of all, I can support all the proposals that were made in the previous sessions. That's very interesting, very inspiring. Um, on the NAPs, um, I'm in charge of the French NAP, and there are some stakeholders also involved in the process, in the, in the French process today. Um, I think that's um, the question, the main question we have to address today, and we have to address in general regarding um, uh, human rights and, uh, and business, is um, how to bridge the gap between the principles and the implementation and the compliance, because there are many principles, maybe too many, and we have seen this morning, we, are, we, are, we now see that there are a lot um, also of answers. There is a wide range of answers, but there is, no, there is no magical, no universal answer. That's maybe the problem. Um, and in that perspective, I think that the national action plans are the right answer for, for the time being because they go global to local, and th that's the process um, where all the stakeholders can um, have the ownership of the, those guiding principles. And there we have to find a smart mix between, uh, 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 among all that uh, range of options. So that comes to all the stakeholders to discuss and to find the right balance between judiciary, non-judiciary, mandatory, non-mandatory, voluntary, um, and to use all the kind of options. And so um, I think that the process is as um, important as the, the arrival, as the goal. Um, in France, we have very <laughs> long and, and uh, comprehensive pro process. But um, it's very interesting to, to see that uh, we can 
that's very complementary. We can have a lot of, we can use all that tools. And for instance, in, in France, we, I think that the core of the national action plans would be the um, due diligence code of conduct or due diligence plan that was also um, mentioned this morning by the, the member of parliament, Dominique Potier, because it may be a law or it may be something voluntary, but what is important is that we agree on the fact that um, uh, respecting the human rights is not an option and to find the, the tool to, to do it. And so if we agree that we have to have that compulsory um, duty to respect the human rights, we, we can discuss on the substance, on the content, and uh, that's what we will do uh, with all the stakeholders, and we will do it also in the OECD framework. And uh, so that's, uh, that's very important to have that kind of ownership and to, to, to find a way to, um, to have the national answer to, to uh, the guiding principles. But there is also to find a common ground with all the, the other countries, and that's why we come to the EU, and it's very important also to have that discussion with the EU partners to have that kind of comparability of level playing field, of peer learning, of peer review maybe. I think it will be very useful. And also to have the EU um, uh, who can play a, a role in the outreach also for the other countries in order to have technical support and to share experience that we may have in the EU uh, in, those, in those NAPs. Thank you for that. And, and I mean, as, as you highlight there, many tools, many approaches, are, are benefits of a level playing field, but also you know, agreement around this idea that respect for human rights is not an option. That, that is a, a, a base expectation for, for everybody. Um, and, and Ray, let me come to you, because we can look at ac across these different tools, and yet we had one of these conclusions that pointed to the constraints that come from a short-term perspective in um, what drives investment decisions and therefore what drives board decisions and senior management decisions. And, and so long as we're driving towards short-term returns uh, for investors, that this can cut across these various tools that governments might use otherwise to try and uh, drive respect for human rights into practice. Tell us a bit from your perspective about what we can do to, to tackle that, to make some progress, to enable, create this enabling environment where companies aren't sort of working in, in, in opposing directions on this. Um, I, I attended a fascinating session this morning on, on corporate governance and developments in that area and regulation of capital markets. Uh, and I know that's one of the themes that came out today. Microphone. Do we have a working microphone? <coughs> Try again, Ray. Okay. There we oh, go. That's better. Um, I went to a fascinating session this morning that discussed um, challenges in corporate governance um, and the historical reasons why companies are constrained from behaving in particular ways and why they're incentivized to behave with short-termism in mind. Um, and so obviously until we deal with those structural issues, um, it's very difficult to engender positive change. So I think in, in those areas, as well as the regulation of capital markets, for example, um, this is you know, a classic area where it's important to look at the root causes of why particular behaviors have developed uh, and to think of coherent and effective policy ways to deal with that. Um, the, the investor, uh, the company behavior, the, the operation of markets issue is, is obviously a vital one um, because it, it d explains in many ways the wealth disparities that we have now and the root causes of many um, adverse human rights impacts and the obstacles to actually changing those. So if we can ad address those uh, in a policy way, um, looking at the, the legal frameworks, for example, that surround that and therefore why behavior is constrained, then that could make a very positive and, and huge impact going forward. Forward. Terrific. And, and, and playing then towards that discussion about human rights due diligence, we want to build these sort of capital market environments, uh, decision making environments that avoid sort of, in a way, companies' decisions being pitted against them. You know, on the one hand, respect for human rights, on the other, all these other drivers. Uh, some of the drivers, Edward, that we saw put up on the screen uh, were around human rights due diligence, different tools we can use uh, in that regard. Pick out one or two of those, if you would, for me to, to say uh, a few words about which ones you see as priorities for action and maybe some thoughts on specific action. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, yesterday I had a, a, tel, a, 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 a telcon, a video conference with some colleagues in Africa, and I was thinking 
if this video conference would have been tomorrow, what could I tell them on the results of this conference? And more important, what, you could, what could you tell right holders or victims in, in Nigeria or in Senegal or in uh, Johannesburg and South Africa or in Congo on what happened with this conference? And I think we have made a lot of progress. And, and one of the participants said during a break, it's like sometimes a bit like watching the grass grow. And you don't see that it's growing, uh, but it certainly does. At the same time, I'm quite impatient. And I'm impatient because not because we don't produce enough uh, case studies, research, guidances, position papers, resolutions, and, and whatever, but because the suffering and the, the, the injustice uh, for very many people, too many people, are just continuing. And the, the, uh, the conclusions or the recommendations on, on due diligence I think are very good, but I want maybe to take one step further. And what we really would need now after so many years of first of discussion and then of having the UN guiding principles and, and seeing where we are now and realizing that, for instance, in Switzerland, uh, some uh, research, recent uh, research showed that only a very small fragment, a very tiny percentage of, of companies are really doing due diligence as, as it is necessary in order to do no harm and to justice to the do no harm principle. I really think we need legal mandatory responsibility on EU companies uh, to undertake a really human rights due diligence to prevent abuses. Uh, in the context of global operations. And, and that, is, that could be really a step forward. And I know it's very difficult, and I've spoken with very many people on legal uh, obligations and the difficulties of that, but I think we are now in a situation really to see that we need to take this step. Mm -hmm. Well, let me play that then, Marine, over to you, because we heard earlier from your parliamentary colleague talking about the French experience with this and the French parliamentary ambitions around this and the ambitions shared by, by many. Um, looking then at this question of uh, the mandatory aspect of human rights due diligence, uh, what's, what are your thoughts around that and where it needs to go? Well, you know, there was this process in France, so we... Um, going on, and we will see whether the law was passed or not. But um, we think, and um, Dominique Potier told that this morning, that it would be even better at the EU level because that's not because there is a French law that will prevent um, problems like the Rana Plaza. We need to have a more global uh, perspective, and of course, we expect and. The, par the French Parliament is really um, involved in that process. We expect that uh, um, beyond the EU directive, we'll go to another step that could be um, that um, duty of, uh, of due diligence, human rights due diligence. And um, as he, he said this morning, there will be a, a meeting of national parliaments um, next week. Uh, with the green card, and so we hope, uh, and I, I was very interesting and very inspiring this morning by um, the study that was uh, um, presented by, um, I think it was Sis Van Damme, uh, talking about different options, um, including one he thought was ambitious, it, it was a statutory duty of um, human rights due diligence, something like that. So I hope that uh, the EU Commission, uh, there will be some kind of um, reflection um, about that and that we could discuss uh, at the EU level on, on a framework that could help to, also for the companies that would be, I think they expect what they have to do to implement the, the due diligence. So that would be helpful, I think, to have that uh, on the EU level to avoid kind of um, different um, implementations um, and to have the level of state of play that um, companies are also um, expecting. Mm -hmm. and, and in what you're saying and in, in, in what Dominique was saying earlier, I mean, very much hearing that you know, the root of this is the issue of access to remedy. That's really the driving consideration behind it and looking at... Um, uh, how, how law needs to evolve to, to respond to the gaps that we, 
we see in that area. I mean, sticking with the theme of law, um, and coming back to you, Ray, uh, lawyers in this space, right? A, a whole profession. Um, they sit in different places, they do different things. There are different domains of law. Um, they sit within companies as in-house counsel, they advise companies from outside. They take different roles as defense lawyers and plaintiff's lawyers. Uh, share with us some thoughts from your perspective about what the legal profession can do and perhaps needs to do as an active player in this space to drive progress. It was interesting to see today just how many of the themes that were developing had potential legal aspects to them or were being conceived uh, within legal frameworks. Um, the word leadership was used in many of the sessions that I attended, and I think that there's a real call for leadership here among the legal profession to bring the variety of perspectives um, and expertise into the debate. I mean, if we take the example of, for example, uh, human rights due diligence and creating a legal duty around that. Um, the, the task of unpacking the relevant concepts within the guiding principles uh, and putting them within a legal framework in an appropriate way would be immense. It's important, uh, vital, if you're embarking on that kind of journey, uh, to understand what the objective is and then to obtain the views of all constituencies and all areas of expertise. So often uh, these uh, Ideas are advanced, the principle uh, seems very exemplary, um, but they may be developed exclusively by ac academics or by NGOs, uh, and then they have to be uh, transposed into a policy space. It's vital to inject the business dimension into that, the understanding of commercial lawyers and that area of expertise. I think lawyers actually are quite open to ideas and understanding different perspectives, but it's vital that those opportunities for discussion um, do take place so that the, chat, the objective may well be a shared one, but uh, only those different constituencies can identify what the practical obstacles or pragmatic issues may be. If you talk to companies or their lawyers about what kinds of regulation work and don't work, um, you'll gain a very you know, useful perspective. It's incumbent on governments, I think, to reach out to the corporate world to understand you know, what does and doesn't work in their industries, because it's it obvious it all it almost invariably depends on how that industry works. So I think um, lawyers also have a role, I think, in, in bringing business to the table to inject that perspective as well, because no, you know, no two companies are necessarily going to um, have the same interest in a particular issue, uh, but it's important that they understand what's happening and that there is that opportunity uh, to bring the perspective to the table. Now, that's a challenge, including in relation to access to remedy. I mean, I think in terms of finding solutions there, for example, if we sit down in a room with plaintiff's lawyers and defense lawyers, it never happens, <laughs> but actually they can learn so much from each other um, and actually start to see what the structural issues that are that um, encourage particular kinds of behaviors um, and therefore can come up with a solution. So I think that by collaborating and discussing in these areas, both by lawyers and with bringing business in, uh, we can achieve a lot. Thank you, and it, it brings us back in a way to some of what we heard from Keith Van Dam earlier, where you know, sitting down and really breaking down these high-level objectives into well, what, what would be the component parts and what could be achieved by that. And it puts me in mind of a, a, an interesting meeting we had opportunity to be involved with, um, organised by the Office of the High Commissioner as part of their work on access to remedy, pulling together also some prosecutors general from different states. And sometimes their barriers weren't legal barriers, they were really rudimentary practical barriers about translating requests for evidence and things like that. So, so sometimes as you dig under, the barriers are, are of different types than one anticipates to progress. I mean, this theme of access to remedy yep. then, there are so many parts to it, there are so many challenges, there are so many barriers. What would you see, Edward, as the, the, the top ones that we need to prioritize for action? Well, I think what Ray said, I, I understand and I agree, but one thing during a parallel session, one of the presenters said, why is all the burden on lawyers on this? Why do lawyers have to undertake so many activities? And 
I think it's very important that lawyers do what they do, and as, as you stated, they have a lot of uh, experience, they have a lot of expertise, a lot of uh, uh, drive to, to, uh, to go on, and you have the litigation lawyers, the defense lawyers, but it's very important that governments come in in an active way, and that governments come in in an active way really to see that all the stuff that we have and all the materials that we have of the Council of Europe, of, of the, uh, as you mentioned, uh, Caroline, of the uh, Office of the High Commissioner on, on Human Rights, which will be submitted, I learned, to the Human Rights Council in, in, in June already, to take all that material and to build on that and to take some steps that we really make progress on that. Mm -hmm. And it, it is at hand, it is very near, but, but if governments really reach out and have a firm position on that, that would help enormous, enormously, I think. Thank you. Maureen, um, wrap us out here. One of the uh, conclusions there refers to the Sustainable Development Goals and how human rights need to fit with the whole conversation that's opening up in governments, in C-suites of companies, on boards, around the role of business in achieving the Sustainable Development Goals. So any sort of quick thoughts from you about what, how we need to bring these two discourses together to bring us back to policy coherence? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I think first of all, that um, we have to have um, a EU comprehensive and um, <coughs> inclusive policy uh, and to use all the leverages we have at the EU level. And I'm very grateful to the Dutch presidency because tomorrow there will be a, a council with conclusions on trade development issues, bridging all that together. And I think that we are, I think the lady um, made the point that EU is quite powerful, and we have to use that power to um, uh, increase the um, uh, social and environmental norms, standards in the world. So we, ha we have to use our leverages. And the Sustainable Development Goals should be um, the way we um, increase the standards in the world to increase the sustainable development in the world. So we have to... Um, inject some um, of human rights in our free trade agreements, some uh, human rights in our ODA policy. And so that's why it's important to have that uh, policy, uh, that constituency at the EU level. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to, in a second, ask Richard Howitt, um, who's a sucker for punishment, yet again to come up here and give us some uh, closing reflections from his perspective. Um, but as I do that, please uh, join me in thanking our panel for a stimulating conversation. Thank you. Well, as I say, um, Richard was supposed to be in Strasbourg today, I think, for the rest of his day job, and we'd hate for him not to be able to justify the fact that he's spending it rather here in a much more stimulating conversation. So uh, we asked him to, to give a few wrap-out thoughts from what he's heard from this panel and perhaps reaching back into the rest of the day. So, Richard, uh, over to you for some closing thoughts before the presidency. Uh, thank you very much uh, um, for indulging me by giving me a second chance to to speak. But uh, I think we all are here because we're passionate about this subject. Someone said that we're preaching to the converted earlier, and that probably is true. Uh, but there is merit. There's merit of coming together with like-minded people, sharing ideas, increasing your enthusiasm, coming up with shared strategies, and then taking that new energy and momentum on. Uh, and all of this has been achieved so far by people like us getting together in rooms in Europe, in the UN and around the world. And I think we've been doing it again today. Uh, and I believe that this has been an extremely positive uh, gathering. I can't tell you how, um, how much support I want to give to the Dutch government and the Dutch EU presidency. They've injected huge energy and priority. Minister Plumen personally, all of the services, Minister Kunders, who we saw on the video this morning, and I believe they're going to drive through some very, very interesting conclusions on business and human rights as part of wider conclusions on global supply chains, uh, and we wish them success with that, and I believe this conference is feeding in their ideas into that process, 
and a number of the EU government representatives are in this room, I, not just the Dutch, I've seen the Belgians here, I've seen the British here, and I think others that I've not managed to catch up with, but are here, obviously our French colleague, uh, who was ju just uh, with us, and I think that this conference will inform their thinking on that, and I'd like to congratulate our Dutch hosts very much. I'd like to say that, in a way, this is a celebratory event. We're all very serious about why, what we're doing, but it is the five-year anniversary. This is the reason, the, the peg that has been used to draw us all together, and five years since the guiding principles were agreed. Here we are still talking about them with as much interest, I think with as much energy and, and momentum as we, would, we, we all would wish. And I was just trying, I didn't get time to finish, but I was just trying to think of other international agreements that were made in the year 2011 that perhaps, do, can anyone remember any other agreement that was in 2011 or want to Google it quickly? I bet there was one, wasn't there? Someone Google it and tell me later, uh, tell me in a, a minute or two when, when you've done it. But I think it's testament really to all of the work that we're involved with that, that, that this much energy is behind the, the guiding principles. I thought it was important to say where the world is. Before we decide what we do as, as Europe or what we do next as Europe, it's important to understand where we are in the world. And I think uh, uh, the discussions in Geneva are extremely important. Um, we've seen a lot of really good work. My colleague Raoul is here in the OECD, but some really good work uh, in the OECD, first of all on supply chain in the extractives, now in relation to the financial sector. I think we need to notice that and we need to learn from it and we need to apply it. Uh, I think we as Europe therefore need to do our bit and the European Commission has decided that the flagship initiative on uh, clothing, uh, textile, garment, leather uh, sector is going to be a next big sectoral approach for us in Europe. So we've got to do that well and that's something that we have to make sure we do well from a European point of view. I do think there's an issue of capacity at the world level and we've, we saw uh, Dante earlier, Michael from the working group is, is, is here too. And I do think as Europe, we do fund some of the work of the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, but I think we could do a bit more in terms of supporting the capacity of the working group as well. And I know some discussion is going on about that, but if I say it in this bit at the end, then hopefully that can help get into the process because the working group is the successor to John Ruggie and we need to enable them to do their job. So I hope that has been listened to. And I would say, um, uh, sparing your blushes, Caroline, but for you and all your colleagues, I think the UN Guiding Principles reporting framework is a very, very important step forward that has maintained that momentum. I think the database you've brought out is extremely interesting and shows a number of companies are doing this. For people who are cynical about companies, just read what's on there. Uh, and I would like to see the UN Guiding Principles reporting framework referenced in the new guidance on the non-financial reporting uh, directive, and that's another way that we can assist at the world level. I think we can notice as well that Rana Plaza has probably been the key issue in the last two years that has grabbed world attention. And what we've seen in terms of the accord, and we've got a representative of the accord here, I think it was in one of the parallel sessions rather in the plenary, but it's, it's a super important development at the world level because it's not about simply about companies respecting human rights and preventing negative things happening. It's about companies and all of us proactively preventing, preventing things and going out and taking action proactively to do so and spending a bit of money and a bit of time and a bit of energy in doing so. And if the Bangladesh Accord is successful and it's still work in progress, is true. But if it is successful, one, the human rights of workers in Bangladesh are going to be better in their own right, but two, we can actually follow, uh, follow that example in other countries of the world. And I think we need to give support to all of that. I think in terms of the Europeans' external uh, role, uh, I think we can still do a lot more. Stavros Lambranid is fantastic, and you heard his commitment this morning that the UN guiding principles must be given teeth by the European Union, but we need to see that, and we need to see that in the new CSR action plan. Uh, uh, I'm delighted that that commitment has come from Commissioner Biankowski, but let's actually see that in there. And I do think, and we said it this morning, but I do think we need to see a commitment around due diligence and European action against advancing due diligence. And I gave some examples of different options that may be available this morning, but we clearly need to see what's happening on that and to see that advanced. 
within uh, within the uh, the uh, course of the action plan because I actually do listen and uh, this isn't all pre-prepared yesterday or a week ago I just need to check that I've uh, covered all the all the notes that I wanted to do I want to appeal to the companies here the companies haven't been represented, I think, in the numbers that I would like, although it's about 25% that's here that have been here. Thank you for thank you for coming, and I repeat what I said this morning about um, uh, uh, about the importance of bringing you with the other stakeholders uh, in the way that we um, uh, go forward. But I want to appeal to the companies: don't wait, don't wait for guidance, don't set up you know, just join another working party and think it's all going to be done for you. Get on and do it. You know, and that's what I think in relation to the implementing of the non-financial reporting directive, but I think generally about implementation of the guiding principles. And I believe we've seen a confidence and assertiveness by the companies that have presented at this conference that they are much more comfortable now to talk about these difficult issues than they were before. And I think the rest of us and other stakeholders, whether you're from the world of politics or the world of NGOs, uh, or, or journalists or whoever have you are are prepared to give more credit to companies who do implement uh, um, the guiding principles and are more open about the shortfalls with it within their uh, within their approach um, I think we're nearly there on the national two final things I will mention on the national action plan oh no three f final things impact impact we've had a lot about impact today we've heard from FIDH about the failure to have the impact assessment in the, in the Vietnam uh, agreement. I do think our trade function is also very important and we had a very good discussion today about the importance of having an enforcement uh, or oversight um, uh, uh, mechanism within future trade agreements. I hope that will be part, part of the future. Uh, but uh, we also heard from our friends from Total, the oil company, that impact assessments are published, but they, they're, they're hidden away, not on their website, but on government websites, wherever, uh, in relation to individual projects, and then disappear after three months. And Total said, no, let's make it more transparent. Let's put them where people can see them. And that was a very welcome commitment there. So I think we can do uh, a lot more in terms, uh, in terms of um, impact. And I am going to finish, because I know we've run out of time. So let me finish on uh, this. Um, I said it was a celebration because it's five years of the guiding principles, but we are all here to uh, address human rights abuses. The access to remedy points, I think, have to be heard. John Ruggie's appeal, again, for us to deal with the problems of extraterritorial jurisdiction. I repeat what I said at the IOE event in London, that I think the study that's been done by the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights into uh, the most egregious cases of human rights is the way forward. There are others who say that you can't divide uh, human rights. I accept that in principle, but we've made no progress, serious progress, on the issue of extraterritorial jurisdiction, uh, and we need to do it. And if you need to be convinced, then think back to 23-year-old Luria Cacheres, who spoke in the video right at the beginning of this conference, who lost her mother only in March of this year, and think, what are we doing to give her justice? What are we doing to give her justice? And then let's go out and deliver it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Richard, for uh, many good exhortations to action and a real tour d'horizon of the, some of the topics we've discussed today. All that remains for me is to welcome Mr. Andre Haspels from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He's the Deputy Director General for Political Affairs to come to the stage to uh, say a few closing remarks. Thank you, uh, Caroline. And I see my closing remarks are... Uh, indicated as a goodbye. Um, so I'm going to say goodbye to you. Uh, unfortunately, I've not been able to uh, attend uh, the whole day, uh, but thanks to the panelists and thanks to, uh, to the two speakers, to Debbie and Richard, I've been able to get a, quite a good overview of the important issues that have been discussed uh, uh, today. Um, 
during the opening session, um, well, and I would like, of course, to, to thank you all for your contributions, for your observations, for your discussions, uh, because organizing the event is one thing, but without you, we couldn't have done that. Um, Minister Kunde said uh, through the video at the opening uh, session that the EU should lead by example when it comes to business and human rights. And, and following today's discussions, I, I would like to highlight just three points in my goodbye that are crucial to the ambition of going forward. First of all, I think that the EU has to become more consistent when it comes to applying the UN guiding principles. It has already been mentioned. Um, we were one of the, um, the first countries worldwide to adapt a national action plan on business and human rights. Uh, and despite the commitment of all EU member states uh, to follow, the EU still counts no more or no less than only seven uh, member states uh, which have national action plans. And we are convinced that through peer pressure and peer le learning among EU member states, we can get a, a better result. And that's why tomorrow in The Hague we'll organize um, uh, a first systematic, systematic per, peer uh, learning session on business and human rights for all EU member states. And we hope that this gathering will be repeated on an annual basis. Secondly, I would like to stress that national efforts of uh, the EU member states have to be matched at the EU level as a whole. In 2012, and again in 2015, the European Commission committed to formulating a coherent policy to implementing the guiding principles. And the Commission is now working on the new action plan for responsible business conduct. It has already been referred to, and we have high expectations of the integration of the guiding principles into this action plan. For example, in areas such as pr procurement, incentives for human rights, due diligence, transparency, and corporate governance. Thirdly, and it has also already been mentioned, access to remedy. I think this is the keystone for a functioning business and human rights framework. The third pillar of the guiding principles has not seen the progress it needs and it deserves. EU member states should address legal and procedural barriers to remedy in their national action plans or related policy measures, as we did in the Netherlands three weeks ago. And we should also try to strengthen avenues for non-judicial remedies, such as the OECD national contact points, uh, the Ombudsman has been refer uh, mentioned earlier, and both issues, judicial and non-judicial remedies, should be treated as a matter of priority by the European Commission and its new action plan on responsible business conduct. Now, our presidency will end in, uh, in six weeks' time, uh, but before it ends, we intend to push for EU Council conclusions to lay down these steps in writing. We will also take on board the remaining conclusions of today's conference that I haven't mentioned, and in doing so, we hope at least to have an impact that will outlast our presidency. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, the spirit of Berta Caceres, it has just been mentioned, cast a long shadow over this day. Following her murder, we should all be encouraged that justice seems to be taking its course in Honduras. But we should not only focus on Honduras. For every case like hers, there are countless people who suffer the same fate. And people whose human rights are infringed upon in, another, upon in other ways, and people who remain faceless to the eye of the world, who remain nameless. And therefore, we should not accept that European, or actually any company, may be contributing to or even causing harm such to such right, uh, human rights abuses, especially when it concerns the most marginalized people, the most vulnerable people, and sometimes invisible communities in the world. Whatever progress the EU makes in the area of business and human rights should be measured by this yardstick, actual impact on actual people, bridging the gap between plans and implementation. These are the crucial next steps to take. In the Netherlands, we are ready and we hope you are ready for this as well. Thank you very much. That brings the conference to an end. I should imagine with the temperature in here, some of you are rather desperate for a little refreshment and possibly not just water. Um, so with that in mind, the hosts are pleased to invite you to a reception back in the coffee area that you're familiar with from the break. So everybody, please make your way there. Thank you. <laughs>